One of the most common arguments that I hear today when it comes to health is the never-ending debate of quote-unquote conventional medicine versus holistic or adjunctive or functional medicine. If you haven't picked a side yet or this hasn't cropped up on your radar, you'd hopefully have a better understanding of what's going on after this episode. Now, I'll be honest, I'm probably biased in this because I've actually worked very closely with today's guest, Dr. Sam Van Eden, over the last decade, and I know that our views line up on a whole load of these topics. But the reason I'm biased is that over that decade, I've seen not hundreds, but thousands of people benefit from an approach to healthcare that focuses on individualized treatments, that looks for happiness and actual results over just managing symptoms, that does use a lot of conventional treatment, but that's supported by a mix of adjunctive tools like nutrition, exercise, stress management, mindfulness, and many treatments learned and adapted from other medical systems. So yeah, this conversation may have a bias, but Dr. Sam explains in this episode why he thinks the way he does, why he treats his patients with this approach, how he was trained to address health issues differently, and he gives us his view on why it's better to try and keep people healthy and prevent the illness instead of waiting for them to get sick and dealing with it then. I'm sure we're opening up the floodgates with this one, but let's have the conversation. Enjoy it, guys. Welcome to the worst self-help podcast in existence. Welcome to our shared journey to try and find the answers to questions about health, wellness, performance, nutrition, life and success, and to craft the most resilient, hardy and happy humans you've ever seen. Welcome to the Primal Podcast. Okay, Dr. Sam Van Eden, welcome to the Primo Podcast, and thanks Thank for joining you, I'm, I'm delighted to be here with I you. I appreciate you being yep. here. Thanks very much. Um, so what I'm going to do is, f- as, a, as a disclaimer, first of all, I'm going to just let people know we've worked together for a long time, so we're very familiar with each other. This is not a, a, exactly. a, a, happen, a happenstance meeting on the street, um, but I'm going to give a bit of context to why I wanted to have this particular conversation with you, because we do run another small podcast and we work in the clinic together, um, but that's quite specific in its, in its mm-hmm. goals. What I'm hoping to get across to people here is more of a general understanding of um, what we call functional medicine, the, mm. the, the type of approach that you take, health and wellness in general, and really just kind of get an understanding of you and why you do what it is that you do in your clinic and in your practice, where you've come from, uh, and how you've seen kind of the, 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 the landscape of medicine and health change, especially mm. through the different countries and, and through the years that you've worked in, in different parts of medicine. Um, so just to put a bit of shape on that first, the the the, the kind of the history of our story is I studied physiotherapy, athletic therapy originally, yeah. um, and when I finished training, and some people know this story, I was very very frustrated, and it had nothing to do with the quality of the education or the course or anything like that. But the kind of when you when you do courses like this and you're educated like this, it tends to be one plus one equals two. So client comes in with an mm-hmm. issue, could be an ankle problem or something like that, and you do certain test you get a certain result and that's the answer but I knew from working with people that that it was never like that there was always 50 different things and I was a little bit frustrated because I didn't have the tools or the skill to be able to 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 look outside that box if you want to call it and then I came to work in your clinic and you very kindly took me on board when I was just out of college to see some patients and stuff in in the clinic Mm. and you were a GP at the time and this is going back over 10 years now um, and you're working as a GP and I was watching, and I'd seen GPs before, and I'd been to GPs before, and it's again, it's a very, it's a very linear kind of process. You go in, you present mm. your symptoms, whatever, and you, you're given your medication, your your advice. But with you, it was totally different, and it really resonated me f- with me for this reason. We, you'd have a client go in, and rather than five or ten minutes later, they come out with a script or whatever it was. They'd be in there forty minutes, um, and was difficult as a staff member to manage. But mm. they'd be in there for forty minutes, and they come back out with this list of advice and studies and um, external kind of um, kind of guidelines as well as obviously the medication that they might need and some some kind of guidance on the lifestyle they needed to change and for me it was really really eye-opening to see that in a GP practice because notoriously GP practices are go, 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 go. You have to get a certain amount of patients in every day. It's very, very difficult to run it effectively. And, and, and it's, it's, it's almost like a, a kind of a revolving door. But it wasn't like that, really. It was crazy all the time because there was a lot of people in. Um, but people seemed to be getting better 
uh, regularly and seemed to be quite happy with with that process and the practice just continued to grow and grow and grow as more and more people came on referral to you Mm -hmm. so that really opened my eyes in terms of it wasn't one plus one equals two mm. anymore. There was a different way of doing it, mm. um, and then we, obviously we would start to talk, and you'd explain your approach to, to this was, and it was it was refreshing to me again because I hadn't seen it, but it, it was really familiar to the, the frustration I was feeling. It, it offered another way, so I actually started to apply that to my own patients with the mm. physio. And there was a lot more kind of holistic approach and all that kind of stuff. But would you mind for people who don't know you? First of all, maybe give us a little background on your journey and, and, and all those different types of medicine I mentioned, where you came from. Yeah. And then maybe give us an understanding of where, where that came from, that, that kind of that approach to dealing with patients or to mm. dealing with a problem um, or, or an illness or a symptom or whatever it was. That, that kind of, for me, it's really different. Would you mind mm. giving us a bit of background on that? Yeah. I think um, um, it's, it's a wide topic that you opened there, yeah. Dan, and it is certainly more a philosophy. Okay. than just a, a science. Um, and I think the the, uh, the first thing I want to say, w- the, the methodology that's applied within general practice today is literally um, um, see the problem, hear the problem, and do something about the problem. So it's a very exact um, window of time that the general practitioner is allowed to manage a huge number of of people. So yes, unfortunately, our general GP practice has fallen prey to to the clock and the 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 the, the big and the small indicators on the clock. You know, so eventually you have a number of minutes and you have a huge amount of patients. So I would would not promote to say that it is a bad system. Uh, but what I do say is that it unfortunately disqualify the general practitioner as well as the patient perhaps to have an optimal um, experience where the GP can engage with all of his knowledge and experience for that person. Because sometimes if we had given the time as general practitioners, I'm pretty sure we would have come up with very different approaches, very different diagnoses. But nevertheless, that is the, it is what it is. You paid for a certain amount of patients to be seen within an hour, and you have to fall within the rule book, and you just do it. And I, I was very lucky in that I worked always as a private practitioner. So I was not driven so much by uh, rules to say, <clears throat> oh, you have to do four or five patients Per, 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 per hour, that means 10 minutes a, a, a patient. I ruled my, I made my own rules in that way. I could manage it and I had at least 30 minutes per patient booked, um, which I must say in all fairness is, 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 is make a dif- difference. If you have time to spend with that person, that already made a big difference. The, key, right? yeah. Yeah. the second thing I would say is that I think <clears throat> is where your where your Uh, embedded approach and philosophy comes from. If you're an engineer, you would always try to fix everything with a hammer uh, and and apply it, right? If you're a a, a mathematician, you would certainly try to do it with numbers. And I suppose that applies into medicine as well. Your background and background training would be very important. Although I was trained in, in general practice, I was very, very fortunate to do my housemanship and my follow up training years in surgery in a very, very, very remote hospital. I mean, our closest bigger hospital with only about 175 kilometers from us. I suppose it's worth saying now, if anyone hasn't picked up from the accent, (laughs) you weren't trained in Ireland, you're originally South African. Absolutely. So I trained in Pretoria University and I was posted to a very small remote hospital, which was a training hospital for newly qualified general practitioners and we were uh, exposed to a huge world of knowledge and experience by uh, the way the system uh, was working at the time is that you have your senior medical officers and uh, specialists working in those hospitals and uh, to give you an idea we were about 20 doctors in that hospital but the community was about 250,000. Wow. So it gives you an idea of a very, very busy hospital right down from trauma, surgery, general medicine, general practice. And we had specialists in each one of those fields. And then with your senior house officer and your junior house officer and then you as a, a, a GP a trainee, 
um, well, you were exposed to a huge amount of experience, uh, whether it's anesthesiology, where you have to do you on, on call, you one night you're in surgery call, the second night you're assistant, third night you are uh, on anesthetic call. So, and then you want to have one night off, and then it starts all over again. So, in a matter of four or five years, you gain a huge amount of surgical and uh, anesthetic experience. On top of that, you still have your day, day job in the wards and in theatre. All right. So, um, again, being exposed as a general practitioner, um, remember also in the way the country has vast distances and general practitioners are placed into very small remote towns where you the the surgeon, you are the anesthetist, you are everything. You have to fix to every, that every problem that comes up. A lot of the times it is just impractical. Even people, if they're in a car crash, trying to think that you can put them on an ambulance and send them on gravel road, even to your closest bigger hospital, which might be 150 kilometers away or 100 kilometers away, they won't make it. Yeah. So either you save that life, you do the splenectomy, or you do whatever needs to be done uh, that's it. And that is how the system was, was, was built around. And the knowledge and experience of the doctors was optimized around that model. So when I arrived in, in Ireland it, it, into a real first world country, um, I, I was amazed by the system here because the general practitioners here mainly consulted only. Where, where I come from, the general practitioner it did surgery as well as the general practice. But keeping in mind that exposure uh, uh, to a very different training system has influenced yeah. the way I progressed my career over the following 30 years. I always loved surgery. I always loved interventions. I always was felt very confident because I was very well trained and particularly for 10, 15 years, very, very exposed to daily surgery, we in South Africa, it is it is for instance we in our local hospital under the guidance of of the um, uh, gynecologist you would have performed uh, as a GP uh, hysterectomies. You've done several different types of of um, 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 uh, different surgeries that you just had to do. There's nobody else. There's no thing that somebody arrives on a donkey cart. And she has a tumor in her abdomen. Do you think you're going to send her back? Because when you see her again, she's palliative care and she takes up a bed in your hospital. Yeah. So when she arrives, you put her in a hospital bed, you do x rays, you do blood workup, you do ultrasound, you diagnose the tumor. And if you think that it is safe for you to, to approach the surgery, um, uh, you, you do the operation yourself the next day and you remove that ovarian tumor or whatever it is. Or you do the hysterectomy. So there was no coming back. There's no waiting lists. There's no post boxes. Yeah. <laughs> the way we, we've seen it in, in a first world country, you know. So, yes, it is a very different um, career development pathway that you have in, in a word when you're working in a rural practice. And hence, our training in South Africa was very much um, very intensive, orientated to to um, to uh, allow doctors to be able to do that kind of level of work by the time we finish. So there was huge emphasis on surgery in our training, on uh, 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 anesthesiology, on the ability to diagnose and to use all kinds of uh, multimedia, etc., um, to do that, you know. So, yes, it is a difference in, in where we, 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 the way we were trained, but also the mindset yeah, yeah. was very different. You need to be very confident. And um, if you're not confident, that means you don't have enough experience. So there was great opportunities for you as a doctor to go into a training program in a very rural hospital where you are exposed to that, to burn wounds, to snake bites to all kinds of things yeah. that you are, would never see in a hospital in the middle of a city. And I think that makes a big difference in the kind of doctor that goes out into private practice one day. Yeah. Yes, I think it's, it's a good time just to make a, an important point because we talk about this quite a lot. And I say this in almost every podcast that we do, but 
sometimes when you listen to these kind of conversations, it sounds like a finger pointing exercise and it's not because this is just, that, I mean, your training was born a necessity. You lived in a country where they had to train you to do these things because exactly. you could have been the only, you, you were the only pair of feet on the ground for, for hundreds of miles. Whereas yeah. in somewhere like Ireland, like there's, there's a town every couple of miles and there's usually a doctor and a GP. Yeah. So the training is different. So most, most people that I know in the medical profession includes doctors, nurses, physios, whatever, are very well intentioned, very intelligent, very good people. That, and and again, it's it's not we're not saying the training is bad or anything like that, but it's just different. And when you take it's someone different. from your background and put them in an environment like this, that's when the that's when for me when I saw you, the the differences become very obvious. Yeah. And there are lessons to be learned both ways, I suppose, because yeah. definitely there's lessons to be learned from a third world country or, or, or a poorer country, and yeah. um, from 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 modern medicine and yeah. from first world countries, but. The, the key for me is to be open to learning lessons the other way as well. Absolutely, and I think the the bottom line is that one of the first things that uh, that I want to point out is that when you come into your first world country, you have a total, completely different uh, model in your health system here, right? Where your doctor, uh, GP, would be the referral. Um, most of the time, very little hands on, yeah. and everything goes into your into your referral hospital. Right. Unfortunately, in this country, that is exactly where the bottleneck lies. Because now suddenly you have waiting lists. Yeah. You have people on trolleys. You have a lot of the work going on. They try your best to try to get people back into the GP practices. But the GP practices is also not 100% orientated towards being hands-on. Like, for instance, doing small surgery. Um, um, where in my, in my hand, uh, I feel very comfortable with my surgical impl uh, implements and my approach would always be, I'll do it myself. But at any time that I think there is a, a reference to or a referral to um, a, a local hospital necessary, I would refer. There's no doubt about that, you know. Yeah. But most of the time, from my experience and training, I would have been able to manage most of the minor surgery cases, et cetera, et cetera, would typically would have ended up in 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 a, in a referral hospital. Okay, that yeah. is true, right? Also, I think what might have not might I'm pretty sure it actually influenced a lot of the way my career developed is that I did a, a medical science research degree, and I suppose when you go into science and you do a research particular degree, I suppose that animal that lies, that you wake up in yourself, that questions, um, is, is something that has always driven me, you know. So continuous study is always part of who I am and what I've always been, you know. And to always question myself on the methodologies that I use to go and read up and find the better ways and always try to stay on top of the latest or the best or p best practice way has always formed a very important part of my uh, identity as a doctor, but also surely uh, also uh, in the way I practiced. So I have always been very close to academics and especially when it comes to research, I would challenge my normal guidelines yeah. that I would normally get uh, in medicine, um, not that I don't trust guidelines. I do follow guidelines, absolutely. But I would always like to add to a guideline. Because what people lack, unfortunately, today in one of the diseases that I would call a disease in our industry, we very easily become just book followers as, as doctors. You know, So that's the guideline. That's exactly what I do. I don't go outside of that, and I don't agree with anything going outside of that. And that is a killer for any science. Yeah. Science is supposed to develop. And s science is about self-development. And I think a lot of colleagues, unfortunately, um, um, forget that we first and foremost carers. That's true, that we need to be safe and high standard of practice. But we also have a responsibility to apply best knowledge and best uh, practice according to the best available knowledge. And that is a big thing, because I am a reader, I like my research, has always been a researcher, right? 
And I think if there's differences that people pick up from the way I think, do things is possibly because I would have gone at the end of the day, I might make a little side, uh, side note for myself and I read up that night. Is this the best way? And a patient might get a call the next day and say, that's what I told you yesterday, leave that, I'm writing a new prescription. Yeah. And I would say, I've read up last night and I actually think this is better than the current guideline. Right. So it's not challenging the guideline to say it's wrong. But I think knowledge grows so quickly that by the time that people discover that they are following a guideline, that they, that guideline might not be the best practice at that moment anymore. Now we're getting into the juicy stuff. This, this is a real point of contention and, and not specifically surrounding you, but anybody yeah. who wants to maybe push the boundary a little bit mm. is the balance between safety and patient safety and mm. progression and actual pay, helping people. Yeah. And um, the way I always look at it is there's a lot of people nowadays and they'd speak to you and obviously speak to their family and speak to me and whatever and they're, they're saying that they're not getting better. They're living and they're maintaining their life but they're not getting better. They might have a disease or an illness or, or some sort of mental health issue and it's being managed but they're not getting better. So that in itself should tell you there's a need for progression. We, we have to keep progressing. Now medicine has definitely progressed over the years. It's, mm. I mean modern medicine, is, it's incredible some of the stuff you can do mm. nowadays. Mm. But when it comes to the type of people that you would tend to see who are people with metabolic disease and gen general wellness, it sounds a bit airy-fairy but people who just want to feel good day to day a lot of these metabolic issues mean you don't feel good you've low mood you've no energy and that's that's where i i see the weakness at the moment is that we're so afraid of pushing that boundary a little bit and i mean obviously i'm biased i, I see you practice you, you don't step outside the guidelines it's very very safe mm. but you do try new things and they're mm. always evidence backed even though the evidence might be mightn't be mm. as strong as something like a paracetamol because that's been around for years and years and years it's evidence backed there's good theory there mm. the mm. patient understands it and you move forward and generally you would see results but why i say this is con con controversial is a lot of people, the system doesn't like that kind of change, number mm. one. And that's a fact. We know that's a fact. The system mm. doesn't want to change because it's, it's whoever, whoever is benefiting from the system at the moment mm. will continue to benefit. That, we know that. The, the is, there is a fear there among people, especially people who are trained in this country, because as I said, it, the training is a little bit different, that if you step outside the guideline, you'll either compromise yourself as a professional or you'll compromise the health of your patient. And they don't want to do that. So it's a genuine fear. Mm. But that holds us back. I think it holds us back. Now, it's easy for me to say this because I, 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 don't, have, I don't have patients like you have. I'm not mm. on a medical board. I don't have a responsibility like that to people. Mm. I'm just trying to help and share information. But... Mm. The, the people I've really seen improve are people who have a serious issue, whatever it might be. It mightn't be a, a pigeonhole, you've got this diagnosis, mm. but a serious issue with their life. And they try something new, mm. they try something different mm. with somebody who knows what they're doing. Mm. And that's the key, because the other side of this argument is there are snake oil merchants everywhere. Mm. There's people that are trying to catch out and make their money mm. everywhere. And that's mm. the real danger. And that's mm. what that's what the government and, and the health board and, and the Irish Medicines Board are afraid of, obviously, is protecting people mm. from that. Mm. But there is a there is a midpoint. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Mm. And I think the midpoint is what you're talking about there. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but it's yeah. finding that balance between safe practice and mm. progressive practice. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, like that's how we grow. Yeah. There's loads of things that we don't know. Just, yeah. just, just like I was saying when I came out of college with the physio, yeah. there was so much I didn't know. Yeah. But that yeah. doesn't mean you kind of just do what you were to yeah. do what you were taught. Yeah. You build on it and you grow, and and yeah. then you, you offer that to patients and yeah. see what they think. Yeah. See, Dan, uh, again, um, uh, it is all about being safe for the patient and best practice, right? And the reality is, the, there's an element of individualism in every doctor. You have to be. We we certainly don't want to be robots, yeah. applying and rubber stamping. Everything that comes in, every patient that sits in front of you is different. There's a fact, yeah. And that's a fact. And we should be applying also the fact that the treatment might be different. And that's where a lot of unhappiness happens because a lot of people come in that is different from the standard guideline patient, but they are given the guideline treatment and they have found very little improvement or benefit. And then they're back. And eventually people feel failed by their GP. They make negative remarks and say, I'm no better, etc. And it stems from the point of the, the culture of how we train our GPs. And I'm in a training hospital myself, working in a training university, and I'm 
um, a lecturer in, in Queen Mary University of London for the master's degree in aesthetic medicine. So I have a, a, a good insight over the years also training and love training uh, uh, other doctors. The reality, unfortunately, is that you try to, to pigeonhole a lot of things, to just tick the boxes, to say, I've trained this, I've made this lecture, they've write, written the test, now move on to the next thing. And in medicine, is too much of, of, of a wide topic to apply sometimes exactly a, a simplistic approach than that. So it is true that when we train doctors in the first two years, they do anatomy first, then they do physiology, just how the body functions, right? And then they go in the so-called clinical years where they become disease-orientated and they would absolutely focus on diseases. They start actually with pathology, the disease, they start with microbiology, the infection, and they usually start with pharmacology, how to treat it. So the first clinical year touches on the culture of that mind being transformed over the next four years into the mind of the doctor and stamp the qualification on top of that. Right? So the doctor is trained into recognizing a symptom or a sign, then apply the knowledge to to test that in uh, 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 differential diagnosis, to do special investigations, scans, blood tests, etc., to basically confirm the suspicion, right? And then you come to a point of diagnosis, right? Once you've diagnosed, you have an applied guideline to say for this diagnosis, you should use this and this and this and this treatment, and that's the guideline. Tick the box, out the door, next patient, right? And that's the way people think. Unfortunately, there is a huge amount of diseases that, and especially more of your chronic diseases, and especially some of the terminal diseases, that develops over years. But at the same time, in that period of development, the client might not fulfill all those criteria that a doctor can tick off, do not qualify for actual treatment, because there's no diagnosis made yet. So it's a very gray area. And I think that's where a lot of uh, opportunities are missed. Although we train and do a course in, the med in medicine during your training in preventative medicine, right, that is just a small module in the training of a doctor, right? And I think one of the big frustrations of patients walking into a doctor's room and saying, listen, what do you think about this vitamin and this great vitamin and, and honey and what do you think of this? And the doctor just go blank and because the patient expects the doctor to know something about it, you know. And actually, we're not trained in healthy people. You're trained in sick people. We're trained in sick people. Yeah. And I think it's a philosophy. I think it's a way of understanding and if an uh, experienced GP ex ex makes contact with a patient, I think within two, three, four minutes, that GP already has a diagnosis, have an idea, is this a sick patient or not? Or is it one of these gray patients, right? And if it's gray, it's out of the door, whether I say, come in back and see me uh, after six months, let's keep an eye on that, you know, tell, let me know if anything changes. Those are the terminologies we would use for pay, and rightfully so. Nothing wrong with those terminologies. I'm just saying there's no way and methodology trained for that doctor. Actually, you know what? This might be developing cancer, you know, or this might be developing disease, or he does not have enough evidence to make the diagnosis, bottom line. And unless he's in that position to make the diagnosis, he's basically... As the patient just left in somewhere in the in space, right? It's okay. This might be developing disease, but we 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 don't have motivation or methodology to actually start investigation, unless he has, for instance, a high suspicion that this might be an underlying prostate cancer, right? Then certainly he will write the referral to the to the. Um, uh, a urologist, for instance, or he might refer the patient to a rheumatology or whatever if he thinks it's developing rheumatoid arthritis. So, but until they come to that level of high suspicion, 
the patient is basically left on their own. And I think that is where a lot of people coming into my practice is actually healthy people, but know that they know they are underperforming, they are falling short of the of the abilities mentally and physically. They are not uh, reaching the level of fitness that they should, being on the programs that they are, having the healthy lifestyles that they have. So this, these are my my client type. You know, functional medicine p- particularly is a science looking at how can we manipulate disease development. So I see people long before they're actually diagnosed. And it's my job to actually go and look and see, can we predict and here history and family history and genetic history is absolutely crucial. All right. And hence that we introduce more and more um, DNA telomere the type of testing because to see if we can find an uh, indication of the possible genes that eventually will trigger in that person. All right. So it's very much about identifying possible diseases. I'm not saying the person has it or going to get it. The risk is there, of course, there. But it's how to manipulate that gene not to express. You've touched on loads of things there, and mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm going to pull you in on Now, the first one I have here is, okay, obviously from what you've said there is, you, in, in your opinion, the training needs to change because we need to have a different model for training doctors. But my sympathy really lies with doctors in this country. It's kind of like the guards. It's that they're, they're trying to do a job, and the system doesn't really work for that particular job. It's not optimal mm. for that job. So, like, it generates a bit of bad will with the public because, mm. like you've described there, you might have someone goes in, they know they're not well, but they don't fit mm. the box, the doctor can't treat them, and then they f- they're yeah. begrudging them because yeah. they're not well, they know they're not yeah. well, and nothing has been done. Uh, just a small correction there, perhaps, Dan. Maybe the current system works for people that sick. So, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so th- good point. That, yeah. that, that can kind of say, but what we need to do is develop the field of of functional medicine, doc- more doctors that also can look at the healthy people who is in the process of developing disease. So I suppose there's my question. That's a very good yeah. point. My question would be, for the doctors who are out there, let's, let's be real, doctors want to help people. That, that, is, that mm. is a fact. No doctors out there to not help people. But who are, in, who are stuck in this place where they're seeing a lot of people who they know are not sick, so they can't actually treat them, because if they're sick, they can treat them and they can help them. They know they're in this grey area and there's nothing necessarily they can do for them. They have to mm. say, go away and come back and see me in six months or you mm. don't fit the mould. It's very frustrating for the doctor and the patient yeah. there. How would you, because I know from a training point of view, obviously you, if, you, if you were in charge, you'd, you'd, you'd remodel the training mm. for people. But for the doctors who are practising now and who have to work in this system with, with patients who, who, who don't fit this mould, what, what do you do? Like, where, where do we go f- from here? What's the answer? I, 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 I suppose the first thing I want to say is um, functional medicine, for instance, in Ireland is extremely new. I'm not aware of really any qualified doctors like myself in Ireland at the moment working specifically in this field to start off with. And I think the second thing I want to say is that it doesn't mean if there's not a lot of doctors that it doesn't exist, Right. And the third thing I want to say, unfortunately, in medicine, we have a very biased way of thinking about medicine. And it is very quickly frowned upon by practitioners. If they hear the word functional medicine or regenerative medicine, you know, they nearly threatened by it. It nearly sounds to them like some kind of boo-hoo. Instead of rather putting the bum on the chair and read and find out what is the science about, you know? But in general, doctors would be extremely negative. Can I read you something? Here? Yeah. This is on the, someone sent me this the other day, right? This is on the, on Wikipedia. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, you type in functional medicine, this comes up on Wikipedia. And it says, functional medicine is a form of alternative medicine that encompasses a number of unproven and disproven methods and treatments. Its proponents claim that it focuses on the, quote unquote, root causes of diseases based on the interactions between the environment and the gastrointestinal, endocrine and immune systems to develop, again, quote unquote, individualized treatment plans. It has been described as pseudoscience, quackery, and at its essence, a rebranding of complementary and alternative medicine. 
So when you Google as a patient functional medicine, mm. that's what you get. Yeah. And when you speak to, a, I won't say the vast majority, but a huge amount of people in the medical field who don't practice this type of medicine, mm. you're not met with a, oh, look, I don't really know. Okay, let's have a look. You're met with absolutely not. Yeah. It's madness. It's quackery. Stay away from it. Yeah, exactly. That's where my problem comes in. That's yeah. where there's no middle ground. It's black or white. Yeah. Like quackery. That's, just doesn't, that's yeah. not helpful to read that on, yeah. on Wikipedia. Yeah. And you know what? The reality is, unfortunately... Um, the way our doctors are trained, and this is not only in Ireland, it is worldwide. Anything that is not within your training field, within your time in medical school, everything else but that is quackery. There's a lot of uh, doctors out there that would look at osteopaths and say that's quackery. There's a lot of doctors that look at even physiotherapy and say that's cr yeah. quackery. You know, quackery. The reality is that um, it is out of their comfort zone. And the quickest way for a doctor to, to keep his important stance with that client is to utter something like that, oh, that's quackery, you know. The reality, unfortunately, is that in the end, it is about what is best for the client here, right? So that um, definition that you read there, I'm not surprised by that. And I, th I think that is a lot what we would be in a lot of doctors. If you, if you could have uh, questioned uh, 100 doctors, I think 99 of them would possibly come up with similar reactions like that. You know? So I'm not surprised by that at all because I've worked in that system. And the reality is fear, right? The reality here is fear. People, and especially doctors, fear that they might say to a person, oh, come back uh, after six months, let's review it, keep an eye on that, and that person actually comes back with a cancer. Right. So what then? Right. Are the, is the patient going to sue you then? Because you had the opportunity to look at it. And you doctors live constantly under fear about something like that happening. And it can happen under your watch. We're all humans. Right. So functional medicine, particularly, step into that gray area. And I hope the day will come that doctors like that, general practitioners like that, to say, listen, I don't have the time and I don't certainly don't have the knowledge because this is a science. It is a specialist knowledge base to do functional medicine. I'm going to refer you to a functional medicine doctor, right? Functional medicine is about 300 years old, originated from Switzerland and Austria, and where it was well known as the anti-aging or longevity uh, sciences, right? About 60 years ago, the Americans took hold of the concepts and they brought it into a more commercialized, more broader spectrum of application and added the disease components to it, right? So suddenly you didn't have to only look at longevity, how to make people live longer. You'd also say, but what do we do with somebody that's diabetes? to optimize their lifespan. What about somebody that has a chronic slow uh, developing disease like atherosclerosis with high cholesterol? How do we add them into a longevity program? And that's functional medicine for you. So functional medicine over the last 60 years has made huge and vast progress. So there are uh, actual um, educational programs in the US, training especially, uh, functional medicine doctors, right? So these uh, associations, etc. So they hugely advanced in comparison with Ireland, for instance. But the fact that you have, don't have an established um, uh, industry in a country doesn't make that industry non-existent or less valued. And I would love to see the day where uh, a doctor and a GP can say to a client, you know, it's the third time you're coming back feeling tired. We don't have a diagnosed tiredness. And I'll call a, come back to a diagnosis now for, a mo for just for a moment. You know, but w would you mind going and see, I'm refer referring you to a functional medicine doctor that will investigate your chronic fatigue and chronic fat tiredness. We will do that. I've done the basic test. I've done your thyroid. I've done your vitamins. Everything is fine. Your hormones, everything is fine. But you're still tired. You can't get up at the, in the day. So that's my type of client that, that we specialize into find the root cause 
And that is that is uh, far from quackery. If people want to feel better if they want to write something like that, good on them, you know. Yeah. R- luckily, we have the, 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 the evidence-based uh, that supports the practice and the safety profile to support, you know. And I don't care what somebody, somebody that has no knowledge about it, write about it and then th- put it out there as the truth. Good on them. Yeah. If, if they feel better, <laughs> let them write more even, you know. Hi guys, just a little break from the show for a few seconds to remind you that today's guest is Dr. Sam Van Eden. And today we're discussing functional medicine and how it fits into modern healthcare. If you'd like to learn more about anything we covered in this episode, you can get in touch with the team at podcast at primal.ie. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Primal Pro, P-R-Y-M-A-L-P-R-O. And everything we talk about will be available in the show notes over at www dot primal dot ie forward slash docsam d o c s a m. You bring up evidence there. It's a good. It's a good little segue in, into that because one of the common things that you hear about functional medicine and quackery is there's no evidence. There's not a lot of strong evidence on on, on this. It's it's a, again it's just an easy stick to beat functional medicine with. Um, and from my point of view, because I'm I'm involved in this field. There's, there's an element of truth in that which makes it difficult because there there isn't the same level of evidence or the same amount of evidence in functional medicine as there is in let's call it conventional medicine. Um, I don't I don't like those comparison terms, but let's let's call it conventional medicine. But there's a very simple reason for that, and we've discussed it already. Is that there's a reluctance to invest in that, to invest time and energy in that because it's not the status quo, um, and. The other side, and you might elaborate on this, is that it's very, very difficult to do these large-scale studies because, as you have pointed out, everyone's different. So you're not going to have millions and millions of people in the study that shows one result if you do functional medicine treatment A. One mm. million people will get better. It, it, I don't think it'll ever exist mm. because it's very, very difficult to, to quantify that. Mm when you and me are sitting in this room here and both of us will respond totally different to 50 different treatments and that goes for, for conventional regular mm. medications and mm. for fu- a functional approach as well. Mm. The same diet's not going to suit us, the same uh, medical treatment's not going to suit us, the same stress management, psychological, there's so many different variables, you probably will never have that big level of evidence but that that is the fallback constantly. Not mm. No evidence, don't want to hear about it, no evidence. You're, you're risking your patient's health because there's not enough evidence mm. there. What, what, where, where do you stand in all that side of things? So the first thing I want to say, remember what, how do we practice functional medicine is none different than whether I would have practiced as a general practitioner or a specialist in, in, in medicine or orthopedic surgeon. The basic rules never changes. Safety first and do no harm always applies. So... I use exactly the same treatments. This is not some boo sudden uh, little herbal plant that I pull out there of a cupboard and give it to a patient now instead of actually using proper altroxin for a thyroid issue. No. We still apply and use exactly the same medicines. Right, okay. So there's no difference in the way I practice when it applies to actual treatment for the patient. Right. The second thing I want to say Even in general practice, it is a known fact that we try to achieve evidence-based medicine. But the truth is, we actually have very little evidence for a lot of things that we do in general practice. There's just not existing large studies for things we accept as guidelines. Right. Guidelines are usually formed by a lot of doctors coming together and saying, how would you treat a chest infection? Okay, we all agree that we will go for an erythromycin. There are papers out there that shows that, for instance, erythromycin might be the drug of choice for most of the... Of the but there's no single papers or a group of people or a thousand people tested on erythromycin and a large cohort study, multi-center over five continents, p- gathering up that evidence to form that guideline. So people must just think before they write nonsense like that about functional medicine. In functional medicine, we use exactly the same medicines, the same guidelines that we use in general practice or in any of the specialities. So functional medicine is not uh, 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 grab it from the shelf type of, of, of treatments. You still have to apply the evidence. What I want to say is that I 
I, the, it's the investigation that's very much different. So I think here is a very important part of looking at your functional medicine uh, practice, is that we would not do your just your standardized blood test, right? It would be a much wider battery of tests, including a wide spectrum of hormonal tests, a wide spectrum of, of immunology tests, a wide spectrum of blood tests and bone marrow and and all kinds of specialized tests. It includes liver scans and abdominal scans, MRI scans, DEXA scans. We try to, to look at the wider point and seek if we can find possible underlying developing disease. Remember what I said, a lot of my patients are actually healthy people. They might just have chronic tiredness as the symptom. Mm. It is my job to go and look at that, you know, we would use um, DNA testing and telomere testing, trying to identify possible root causes for that chronic fatigue, chronic tiredness, right? And we do know there's evidence that based, uh, based on facts and small cohort studies, right? And this is the thing about any growing science. Whenever there's a, a new application for a new drug, etc. There's one paper, then there's two papers, then there are three papers, maybe then in the end there's 10 papers. Eventually there's 20 papers to support that particular drug. And drugs go through different phases of research as well. The same applies within any science. And the same applies with when, when you uh, look into functional medicine. It's none different than any other of the specialities, no? Yeah. I'm just going to have a little look just, just on that evidence thing there again because I can see how that could be misconstrued by people. I just want to clarify a couple of points there. Um, I'm sure you, t you mentioned erythro erythromycin um, and antibiotic. Yeah. I'm sure, obviously, there are a lot of studies on it, but I think was was the point that you're making that there might be loads and loads of studies, but there's not necessarily a study that says this is definitely the best treatment for exactly. treating every person for this particular thing. I, I, from what I understand, anyway, I think a lot of the studies are about, is it safe? Does it show a percentage of efficacy across a percentage of people in a percentage of the population? Yes, okay, fine. And then you'd have a cohort of doctors who agree this is going to become the guideline based off that. Yeah. We're not necessarily dealing with studies here that are saying we have tested 7 million people with erythromycin yeah. and it is the number one it's exactly. th it is the number one treatment for every problem that you might have yeah. for, for antibiotics or whatever. It, that's not what you're saying. It's yeah. more along the lines of you can easily say functional medicine doesn't have a lot of evidence that says this treatment will definitely work for you, but mm. it's the exact same in, in medicine. And a lot exactly. of the stuff in medicine, they're, they're epidemiological studies, they're huge studies that they don't really control for a lot of fat. Now, obviously, there's very specific pharmac pharmacological studies when, when mm. they're doing these, um, uh, producing these medications. Yeah. But in terms of actually helping people, actually improving health, yeah. they're very, very broad, these studies, because there's so many vary varying factors in yeah. the individual. Yeah. You, can't, exactly. you can't possibly say there, this medication. The, re is the reality is that, unfortunately, um, I'm not sure if it's unfortunately, maybe it's fortunately, but there's individual experiences of, the, of, a, of a general practitioner that plays a huge role. If a general practitioner uses, for instance, say something like Augmentin as the choice of drug, will keep on using that always because for in his experience, it works for him, even if there is evidence that erythromycin okay, yeah. is best. So I'm just saying, if you apply that to that quackery uh, 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 article that you just read there, you know, I mean, that's quackery then as well, you know, by not following evidence. Yeah. The reality is that it's, I believe, that when a doctor sits with a client, have done the examination, listened to the history, and then applies best knowledge and experience to select the best drug, it's a lot that's influencing that. And it's not just a single evidence-based paper that you. says it's, it's going to be this. I get you. And I think that is what an uh, 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 article like on Wikipedia there tries to reflect on that these people don't know what they're doing. Um, yeah, I, I, I beg to differ. That's yeah. all I want to say. I also remember, it's Wikipedia. It's an article or something. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. slightly with Wikipedia. Um, right, another one for you then. Again, I hear this quite a lot, is that by doing the type of medicine or practicing the type of medicine that you're practicing, you're trying to convince people to abandon 
their their healthcare. You're to abandon their their treatment protocols, their guideline, their safe treatment with their GP or their specialist or their, their, their consultant or whatever in favor of something that you think is better. So I often hear the argument that why 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 is why are you trying to draw people away from what's safe into something that's unknown? And again, they throw the evidence stuff and all that in, but you've dealt with that. But I uh, mean, do you do you try and tell people not to go back to their GP absolutely or not. not to go to their surgeon. <laughs> no, yeah. Now, I know, I look, look, I know the answer to the question. I'm, I'm asking these questions yeah. to try and draw, uh, drive no. the information here, but the, you don't the, do that, do you? Absolutely not. The reality is that functional medicine is a speciality within medicine. And just as like the guy referred to an orthopedic surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon reflecting back on the guy's treatment, say, oh, you should stop this uh, cholesterol tablet. I don't like that. You're taking that. You know, I don't think a specialist that's responsible will do that. And I will certainly don't do that. Okay. If a person is signed up with his GP, I would absolutely love to work with that GP and add my knowledge to that GP's uh, information about this client. There is a 100% referral system like usual between general practice and functional medicine practice. So there's absolutely no issue whatsoever of person having uh, his own GP coming to me and for me writing back to the GP and saying, these are the cofactors that I've identified. This is the evidence that I have to support this. And this is the treatment I advise my client. A lot of my clients would be even be medical card patients. Yeah. Right. That has to go back for their medicines to their GP. I write the letter like normal and say, listen, this is what I find, you know. And would you please support Johnny or Mary for their, their, uh, pract- uh, with their prescriptions? And I've often got letters back from a GP to say, thank you very much for seeing climb. I know she's been struggling for, with her tiredness for years, and thank you very much for solving it. And she's already better, blah, blah, blah. So I don't see an issue whatsoever. It's a well-integrated uh, functional medicine. is well-integrated with a bigger picture, and it's not opposing any, any other that was my next question, yeah. I suppose. Are you, are you getting resistance from other, from other peers, I suppose, medical professionals, GPs, and, 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 and stuff like that? Are you, are you getting pushback? Yes, I do. I, and, and I think, again, it is a matter of fear for the unknown rather than having facts. Okay. You know, and I think once people engage or I engage with them to explain a little bit more what it is, they very quickly cop on to realize, oh, well, Wow, okay, right. So this is not much different from what we would practice in medicine anyway. Right. I don't do have a big cauldron in the backyard and cooking up my own stuff there. No, this is still formal medicine. Okay. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. This kind of brings me to the crux of the point of, I suppose, this podcast and everything. The point for me doing this is to help people make better decisions for themselves. And what, whatever, this is obviously medicine. We'll talk about a lot of things like fitness mm. and health and wellness mm. and all that kind of stuff. But... In this field, how important do you think it is that your client engages? Because I know, I'm, like, again, what I'm trying to do here is, is build a repertoire of information for people. There's a lot more information available mm. now. So it's not like 20 or 30 years ago yeah. where you were kind of limited to what you were being told by, for example, your GP. And if mm. that person as an individual had a, a, an opinion on a functional approach, you didn't get exposed to it because there, there was no real access. Yeah. Now we have so much access. Yeah. I mean, you see it and I see it. People are crying out for information, the, mm. especially the people in the gray area, the people who, who the system is not able to help for whatever reason. Yeah. They're, they're dying for information. Yeah. What I, I always see the people who do best, and this is true when I practice as a, as a physio and AT as well, this was always true for me. The people who engaged mm. and who challenged me and questioned me and brought me in information from, from say, other sources or whatever, I loved that. I, yeah. I never, ever, my ego was never bruised when mm. someone came in and said, you know what, I was speaking to this other guy and he said we mm. should try this. I was like, deadly, get him on the phone. Let's, mm. let's have the conversation. And those people always did really, really well. For me, that was the key in terms of how well a patient mm. of mine was going to do. And I've seen it with you and your clients as well. The people who engage mm. and bring bring stuff to the table themselves, ideas and information, they seem to really, really respond well to treatment. Now, mm. you can go down how the, the, the placebo and motivation and positive thinking and all that as well, but it really makes a difference, doesn't it, when someone comes in and they want to engage in a treatment plan or they bring you ideas or they bring you, look, here's what this doctor said, here's what that doctor mm. said, can we put it all together, how, how yeah. does this work? Yeah. Is that an important part of your treatment? So here's the thing that I'm lucky with, Dan. By the time a person walks into my rooms, most of them have been 
over and over and over seeking help somewhere else. So a lot of my patients are highly motivated to get themselves sorted, has got walked straight into walls so many times before and so, still not being um, um, resolved. And they are highly motivated. So luckily I'm very lucky in that way that I seldom have to tell people, oh, well, you have to engage, you have to do this, you know, if you want to get better. I'm telling you, they're falling over their feet for somebody just to take the time and to actually tackle this, sort it out, put it into paper, and put it into a treatment plan. But they engage immediately with very little motivation from my point of view. So the first thing I want to say is that a lot of my patients, unfortunately, are those who are at the end of the tether that has given up nearly completely because they can't find their way within the normal system. And I just want to say this again. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the normal system when it comes to having a disease, diagnosing disease, and treating it. It is for these people that hangs in the middle, that is developing a disease, that is in the process of going through changes in their, in their body. They're the ones that doesn't fit the model. And let me just quickly reflect on that before I forget. The way medicine is working, and I've uh, ref reflected on this in the podcast me and yourself did about functional medicine, is that the way it works at the moment is that when you are diagnosed and you f fulfill tick box certain criteria, certain symptoms, so certain um, um, uh, signs, and you also fit for instance, special investigations to support that. You then diagnose with a ICD number, yeah. right? Your diagnose has now a number and it has a description. Your medical insurance would be happy to manage everything that's related from there on. But guess what? As long as you don't have a number or an actual diagnosis, form, formal diagnosis, nobody's really interested in you. That's why you're told, come back in six months' time. So it is a huge amount of diseases that is hanging out there that's considered chronic low-grade diseases. Chronic fatigue syndrome is one of them. All right. There's not really interest from anyone to engage with you or spend time with you. All right. The reality is that a person like that is usually highly motivated and will engage with whatever help they're given. Okay. So nearly all my clients walking into me, I have very little uh, um, hardship motivating them to actually engage with the program. But it is also true that there is a mindset out there in the general public, I'm not feeling well, it's the doctor's problem to sort me out. Right. And they would go to the doctor, they will, they will told what's wrong, they will give them a prescription, they go home and they don't think about that. Even if they drink the tablets and they feel better or they don't, but they carry on. There is very little engagement with that person to say, but you know what, I still don't feel uh, well, I'm still tired. You know, I'm going to absolutely hunt this until I get to the bottom of it. There's a lot of people just, just leave it. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point actually because it's 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 often something that's left out of this argument mm -hmm. is the responsibility of the person as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're all guilty of it. You, you want to go to your mechanic and you want to give them money and fix the car. You don't want to have to go in and hold Absolutely. the spanner yourself and change a wheel and whatever, change the oil. Um, and most people don't want it. They just they want to go in. It's this, the society we live in nowadays. Yeah. You want to go into your doctor, doc, not feeling well, what's the med, how long do I take it, right, thanks very much, and you want that to be the end of it, but it's unfortunately yeah. a lot more complex so than that. So in, in, in the field of functional medicine, it will not apply or it will not uh, uh, secure you an improvement if you don't engage. Okay. That's it. That People need to know that, and I tell them, they need to become um, students, they need to learn about their own issues, I will show them the guide what the guidelines. I will show them a roadmap. But they have to get their hands dirty. Right. They have to follow the guideline. They have to engage with the program. They have to, for instance, do basic exercises. Right. They have to follow a diet, particularly. And all of these things are self-engaging actions. Right. So if you're one of those people who think the doctor must come and solve, you walk into me, I'm going to solve a lifelong issue for you, and you're going home and you swallow a tablet, 
Don't come. I can have, I'm going to tear the eyes rolling already. <laughs> uh, can I paint then a little picture just maybe to illustrate that? And you can jump in here if I'm, if I'm missing any points. So if someone was to come in with pre-metabolic disease or chronic fatigue or one of these kind of things, um, let's, let's use one of the treatments that you do, IV therapy, right? So IV therapy, okay. um, just to put it in a nutshell for people, is nutrient therapy for people to, f- to fill gaps that they might have if they're deficient in certain mm-hmm. things. And mm-hmm. there's several different tiers and levels and medical mm-hmm. versions of this. But in a nutshell, you can come in and if you're low in your nutritional vitamins or minerals, amino acids, you can have an IV, basically a bag, hooked directly up to the, 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 the vein and um, introduce the, the mm-hmm. nutrient there. So people come in for IV therapy and there's a common misconception that this is going to fix Mm. me. For example, if I have Mm. a cold or if I'm Mm. not well or if I'm low and my energy's down, Mm. I'm going to have an IV therapy and I'm going to feel great. Mm. So there's your problem that you're describing straight away. Where I look at something like IV therapy is, I always call it a break in the clouds. It's an Mm. opportunity, a booster for people, but it only facilitates them taking this responsibility for themselves so if you're going to come in and your mood is low and you've gone through the process with with, mm. with sam here and had your bloods and all that kind of stuff and you've identified areas that are mm. deficient that iv is literally only to help you get back to a place where you can take mm. control over again because what yeah. you need to do is you need to sort out your diet mm. you need to sort out your exercise you need to sort out your sleep mm. you need to sort out your stress management you might need to manage any external negative stimulus like drink and alcohol and drugs mm. and stuff like that mm maybe your job is getting you down maybe maybe there's some sort of um, underlying genetic issue there having an IV is going to help you maybe in the short term develop the the energy levels and the motivation and the cellular energy to kickstart this process but if you just come in and have an IV and don't fix anything else you're going to be back in next week you'll be back in the following week with the same problem It's, it's a similar problem to what we're seeing with give me the treatment and just fix me but if you have the IV and then you start doing a small amount of all these different things I just described there, that's when it works. It's only with the combination. And some people, conversely, might do all the conservative things already. Some people, I mean, you see people in who are almost, uh, they're like A1 students. They do everything right and they still have issues. Then the IV therapy might help them as well because it might be filling a gap that they have. But again, it's only to get them back to a level where they can take control of yeah, it again. So yeah. so it, th- I think that, that kind of paints that picture of don't expect to come in and say, Sam, give me the treatment and I want to feel great because it doesn't happen. Now, I know there are certain instances, I mean, we have issues like brain issues and depression and things like that where it's slight, a slightly different model, not yeah. totally different. But in general, there, there is a responsibility of the doctor to, to treat the deficiency, yeah. but of the client to make sure that they take care of all of the surrounding factors exactly. there. Exactly. So the engagement that you talk about is exactly that. It's yeah. taking responsibility. Yeah. You know, and I do say to people at the very first um, a consultation I have with him, that this it depends completely on their motivation, dedication, and the responsibility uh, to to take um, uh, hold and take um, control of this treatment protocol that I'm going to describe to them. The second thing that I want to say, a lot of the treatments in functional medicine, yes, we use conventional medicines, uh, conventional antibiotics, if they indicate it, conventional nootropics or whatever we're using in, in medicine. That's one part of it. But a very big part of, of these um, uh, functional medicine relies on a healthy lifestyle and correcting the body back to the normal best physiology of the body so we know there are changes going through the cells in the body as we age and we know the basic concepts of antioxidants we know the basic concepts of of amino acid depletion we know the basic um, knowledge of uh, nad depletion in the body all of these contributing eventually to cell senescence or the dying of of the human body cells, right? And that, in many ways, is called aging, right? So a lot of this is natural processes and not necessarily a disease. So it is my role as functional doctor to distinguish between the things that develop into disease and things that might just be normal functional aging, right? So... When we talk about intravenous treatments, right, again, we lack large studies, but we are not short of very good case studies and individual studies and individual knowledge about, for instance, ascorbic acid. We have vast knowledge about the knowledge of vitamin B12, B6, all the B vitamins. This is biochemistry, which is an industry on their own. 
So there's no lack of knowledge what these things do in the human body. And that is the basis of applying that knowledge into functional medicine that I have the confidence to say to a person, the intravenous treatment that I prescribe for you as a combination of different kinds of macronutrients, micronutrients, vitamins, and all kinds of amino acids. I have excellent evidence-based for every element that we use and engage with. But it needs to be a number one at the right dose, right? And this is where, unfortunately, in the market, there would be all kinds of commercial equivalents like um, drip bars and all kinds of vitamin bars going up left, right, and center trying to make a quick buck. Unfortunately, a lot of that is not based on good science. A lot of that is unfortunately not always to the benefit of the client. It is my duty as a trained and qualified doctor to make sure that the doses that we use are optimal and that they are safe and that they're given in a way that is to the best practice. Okay. Right. So it is again engaging the client with that. Right. And yes, some of the treatments that we do, we are focusing on correcting disease. And a lot of the treatments that I do, I have patients coming in. They might be 60 and they might be 70. And they might say to me, you know what? I think my memory is starting to go. I'm worried about that. Is there anything that we can do? I usually would do an MRI scan on the brain. The scan come back and there are a few uh, little Y dots on the brain, not more than is expected for the age. There's no signs of Alzheimer's. But listen, treat the patient and not the report. Yeah. Right. So that is a very good example. All right. Um, this is a patient that I would advise. You know what? We know that the demyelination of the brain is quicker in some people than others. Right. You possibly lack in vitamin B12, as simple as that, you know. And when you put on the medication through an intravenous drip and you increase the vitamin B levels and you increase the, 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 um, the um, intravenous macronutrients, amino acids, etc., you, over a period of time, then see the person coming back to you and say, listen, you know what? I actually feel much better. We do a score. They fill in a score, right? And we repeat that test after six months and 12 months, and you can actually see the improvement in their memory. Now, it's only then that you realize the value of the treatment, right? So, yes, it's all about the patient engaging, right? But it's also applying best knowledge for that treatment. And it's not just a randomized drip bar approach and I think ascorbic acid is good for you. Everyone needs that and take it. No, it is an applied knowledge with an applied rule base. That is how medicine works and that's exactly how I practice it. Yeah, that's important. That's important. Um, I won't take too much more of your time now. I just want to bring it back. You mentioned um, the model in the States at the moment, the functional medicine model, and that's actually been um, almost accepted into the not so much the mainstream model, but it is an industry. It is growing. It's, it's, it's well accepted among the, the, the public. Do you, see, do you see that model as something that we should strive towards or you're striving towards here where you go into one of these centers and you'd sit with someone like yourself and you'd be like the director? where I come in, or the conductor, and I come in and you'll do my assessment, you'll obviously do your full your, your full workup and you say, right, Dan, this is what you need, okay? You need um, to sort out your nutrition, it's all over the place, we need to maybe do an IV treatment, you need to maybe consider this, but then you need to talk to somebody about your psychological issues, mm. then we need to have a look at your stress management tactics, mm. and then you have to look at your sleep. Yeah. So, you go into that room there, and that's where you're going to talk yeah. to my nutritionist, then you're going to go in there and you're going to talk yeah. to my sleep specialist, and yeah. then you're going to go over there and talk to my lifestyle yeah. guy, um, yeah. and then you're going to come back, we're going to talk about your plan, and that's going to be that's going to mm. be us going forward, and we'll see what mm. we have at the end of it. Is that the model we should look that at? That's, that's the model we should look at in general in, in Ireland and everywhere because that's the model that's been tested in the US, yeah. right? It is the model that we apply in our clinic at the moment. I work specifically with um, um, uh, a few guys within the, the, the nutritional environment, with the gym and exercise environment, with a spa and, and relaxation environment, counseling, different kinds of counseling, uh, formal psychological counseling. We have uh, coming on board also uh, uh, um, addiction counseling. 
So yes, absolutely. You need to have one-stop uh, 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 service under one roof, ideally. Um, what I want to, to say also is that one, when you look at a uh, holistic approach, it, it is, again, two groups of people you're working with. You work with the people that has chronic tiredness or chronic disease developing, right? They are a particular profile people struggling with their health over many years. And a lot of that would be immune system failure related. And then you have the second group of people who are absolutely healthy, right? And has a mindset for longevity and healthy lifestyle. And I think it's very important that I just explain this very important timeline here. In the past, the whole focus of the longevity clinics or the anti-aging clinics was about living longer. There's a very specific science within functional medicine where we divide the lifespan in two, which is your healthy lifespan and your disease lifespan. Every single one of us goes through exactly that, a healthy lifespan and a disease lifespan. The focus of, of functional medicine is to extend the healthy lifespan as long as possible and shorten the disease lifespan, which is inevitable, to make that as short as possible. So you're not necessarily living longer, no. but it's you're living better. Better for longer. Better right? for longer. longer. Yeah, yeah. And then make sure that your disease lifespan is as short as possible. Right. So it means that, for instance, if you have a gene for a severe type of cancer, you might still and you will still get that cancer. Right. But what if we can alternate and manipulate your gene uh, pool and your gene expression? to not trigger the tumor genesis, which is a cert one activity, by, for instance, improving your mTOR pathway, your longevity pathway. It means that cancer gene will offset only at a much later age. Okay. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. That's what make functional medicine can offer, and we have good, good enough evidence in our approach to show that we have ways of extending the gene expressions that you are born with. Yeah. Right. And I think if you look at both these group of people, people who have struggling with long-standing health issues over long periods of time, and people who are just having a mindset of extending their healthy lifespan, right, both are basically following the same routes within functional medicine, right? And that science that's applied there grows all the time. More and more papers are are coming out supporting different ways of of altering the genetic expressions, yeah. right? And luckily, we live in a time where we know much more about DNA and about the genome and so forth. And a lot of these tests are coming on, on board. In our clinic in the next month, hopefully we'll kick off our telomere testing uh, within our own clinic, which will set a brand new standard for 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 controlling my my, my clients, but more importantly from me as a doctor and from a, as a scientist's point of view, to find more ways of better understanding and measuring the value of the treatments we induced. What if we could do a, a telomere test and then start engage on a treatment protocol six months, nine months, or a year later, repeat the telomere uh, test and see how did the genes and the DNA and the telomere respond to these treatments. Yeah. That is really the next the next challenge I have in my clinic is to see if we can find better ways of measuring improvement. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well look, I, I really appreciate you being so candid and honest. I know it's I know sometimes it's not easy to do these conversations because you do make yourself a target for people like like the Wikipedia, the Wikipedia people. Um, bring them on. <laughs> yeah, bring them on is right, yeah. But but I appreciate that. It is very helpful for people to hear all sides of this discussion. Um, and yeah. this is this is one side of the discussion. I'm sure we'll have people in who maybe have differing viewpoints, but it, look, this this, this is really... It, it opened my eyes over the last few years, definitely, in yeah. the way I think about my own health and the health of my family and friends and all that. Um, 
And just, I suppose, as a, as a little nutshell and takeaway for people, because we really only scratched the surface of exactly mm. what it is you do in the clinic, mm. but we, we'll, we'll definitely have you back on. Mm. But as a takeaway, I think it's really important for people to get more involved, mm. ask more questions, work with, if it's your GP or your surgeon or your functional medicine doctor, mm. work with these people. Mm gather the evidence understand your own body get all the information you can and don't be afraid to, to engage in this Absolutely. kind of con and just in the conversation you don't have to do anything yeah. or ever have a treatment yeah. Yeah. but engage in the conversation and, and become an active part yeah. uh, of your own healthcare. Yeah. I suppose I think I want to say this just as a last thing because I think I want to clarify and make sure that I leave uh, a balanced opinion here I, this might not be a field for everyone right um, because it takes engagement if, and it takes time of the client to actually engage uh, with the program and follow it. But if you're motivated enough for whether chronic disease or longevity span, that is your motivation, right? But in the end, the proof is in the pudding down, yeah. right? I would not waste my time to follow a practice in functional medicine if I don't see the miracles every day, right? I love the miracles that happens. And some of them are complete failures. I put my hand up and then we have to try something else, right? But the reality is the, the, the science is well supported by evidence and results. And in the end, people will not pay that kind of money if they don't see results and come back particularly yeah. if they don't see results. And this is the beauty of this. This is a growing science and the more information we gather the more we can put it into evidence and that's exactly what i'm trying to do is to publish and to make sure that we get this evidence out there eventually right but from my general experience i have a very busy practice and i don't think i would have been busy if it didn't work for people the proof is in the pudding as proof is in the pudding. sam thank you very much for your time again Big pleasure, as I said, we'll have you, you on so again much. in the future we'll, we'll touch on all the, the wonderful treatments and stuff like Good. that but, but for now i appreciate you being here very Thanks welcome very much. Good to done. Cheers. Well, guys, hopefully that gave you a bit of insight into the world of functional medicine. If you'd like to get in touch with Dr. Sam or the team here at Primal, or if you have any questions, you can just head over to www.primal.ie forward slash docsam, D-O-C-S-A-M, for all the links, the show notes, and the contact details. And if you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more, then you can follow us at Primal Pro, P-R-Y-M-A-L-P-R-O, on Instagram and Facebook, and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you think your friends or family would enjoy the chat, please don't forget to pass it along. Thanks for listening, guys, and we'll chat to you soon.